Hey everyone, today I want to talk to you about the basics of mushroom foraging, just the practical side of things. What do you bring with you? How do you figure out where to go? What does foraging experience even look like? We're going to cover that. This is a great follow-up to my previous episode, which is the basics of mushroom identification. You don't have to watch it to understand this video, but they go really well hand in hand together. So if you haven't seen that one, hop over and watch that as well. First things first, what do you bring with you? Well, let me show you the things that I like to have with me when I go mushroom foraging. The great thing about it, mushroom foraging that is, you don't have to get a ton of expensive equipment. This isn't like skiing where you have to bypass, buy some gear, take some lessons, find out you really suck at it in the end and you wasted all this time and money. No, mushroom foraging is very simple. You need the most, just, I'll just show you. You just don't need much. All right, you need a basket. There we go, basket, we've got a basket. Uh, a basket or even a mesh bag works well. You wanna avoid plastic to put your mushrooms in. Uh, even after you harvest mushrooms, just like after you harvest fresh fruits or vegetables, there's still life in them. And if you put them in plastic, they're gonna start sweating and therefore decomposing quickly. You put mushrooms in a plastic bag. By the time you get home, you're gonna have a bag of mush instead of a bag of mushrooms. Don't do it. So pick something breathable, like a wicker basket or a breathable bag of some sort. The second reason this is important is because mushrooms, they reproduce by releasing spores. After a mushroom has been harvested, it continues to release its spores. So if you put your mushrooms in something that is airy and breathable, those spores can waft away and it's kind of like your Johnny Apple seeding your way through the forest and helping that reproduction process continue. I like to have a few kind of organizational type things with me as well, especially if I'm gonna go out and I'm collecting for research or to learn new mushrooms and identify and I'm collecting multiple types of species. So a few things that I carry with me to help with that are um, just some extra, extra bags so I can separate things cloth bags in there. Um, I sometimes have some small containers like this to put really small specimens in so they don't get squashed by other things. Tackle boxes also work really well uh, if you wanna separate things uh, into the little compartments there. I also like to have paper bags with me. Uh, those uh, work well to separate things. Um, and I'll tell you another reason why I like having paper bags with me in a moment. And some note cards so that you can write some notes. I actually really love uh, the Write in the Rain notepads. I don't know if you've ever used those. Uh, they work really well in rainy situations, which being out in the Pacific Northwest in the fall, it's pretty much always raining. Uh, and just a nice notebook that you can write on even when it's raining out. I'm also a big fan of Sharpies because you can also use these when it's raining too. Uh, so I always have some Sharpies with me. I don't actually want to get into that yet. I'm sorry. So we'll just cut that out. You're going to want some kind of foraging tool, a knife, a brush is also really helpful for the cleaning and the trimming process of your mushrooms. I use uh, the Openel mushroom knife right here. I've used this for years. I really love it. It has a nice curved blade, uh, nice brush on the end two-in-one tool that comes in very handy. So a good harvesting tool like this is something you wanna have with you. You want to bring along some first aid, safety supplies. If you have any medications, you're gonna be out in the woods most of the time when you're foraging. So bring a map, bring a compass, orientation tools like that, GPS. Um, just be mindful, bring stuff that's gonna keep you safe in the woods, please. The one item I really want to emphasize for you to bring with you A whistle. Bring a whistle. Sorry, it's tied in the knot. The whistle is one safety item that I always make sure I have. I make sure the people with me have. It keeps you safe when you're in a group because you can reorient yourself with each other. You can signal each other. But if you're by yourself and you get lost, this whistle is gonna last so much longer than your voice and reach so much further with its sound that you might be found 
because of your whistle. Just bring a whistle, please. This one breaks away, it's super fancy. All right, so as far as supplies, that's really all you need. You don't even need the extra fancy bags or containers, right? You can just have a basket, a tool, like a knife, your whistle because you're safe. I mean, those things right there can get you started. And then you're gonna wanna get a good field guide or some kind of resource. So how do you choose that? Because sometimes the options are too many. Uh, let me help you with that. Put this aside. Here's some options. <laughs> this is just very minimal. <laughs> so you're gonna have different types of mushroom books, okay? You're gonna have small pamphlets like this. This is actually a tree one. I couldn't find my mushroom one this morning. Um, where it's just like a fold out pamphlet. You can carry it in your back pocket. Pop, pop, pocket. <laughs> in your back pocket. <laughs> and it has some of the more um, common mushrooms that you might come across or most interesting ones that you wanna learn about. Um, in a pamphlet like this. It is not gonna be thorough. This is not gonna be enough for you to feel 100% confident in ID. You're gonna need more than this, but this is great to bring out in the field with you so that you can collect things that maybe look similar to what's in the pamphlet, and then you bring it home and you can go online to a resource or a hefty book as a resource to do additional research in the process. So that's one option is a handheld pamphlet like this. Another option uh, for mushroom books, there are some mushroom books that focus specifically on edible mushrooms. This is my favorite one. Uh, it is The Complete Mushroom Hunter. It's an illustrated guide to foraging, harvesting, and enjoying wild mushrooms. It was written by the late Gary Linkoff. A uh, fantastic book. So it focuses in on the top about 20 edible mushrooms. Uh, it is um, kind of a global resource. So no matter where you are in the world, it's, it has some charts and stuff to help you figure out stuff in your area a little bit better. The thing with this is it focuses specifically on edibles. It's gonna also focus on toxic lookalikes, but it's not gonna give you much in between. So as far as variety and depth, if you're wanting to learn other mushrooms, uh, it's not gonna have the information in there for it. But as far as the edible side, it does deep dive into that, it gives you a little more information as far as how to cook and maybe how to prep those mushrooms. So it's a good book to have, but it's not as complete as a field guide. The other option are your classic field guides. So for me personally, I'm the kind of person who, you know, if I'm wandering around the woods, I want to kind of figure out the names of a variety of things. So if you're a wildflower person and you just love to go on a wildflower hike and you want to name all the things, a field guide is is going to be your option, right? You want to know what's that random thing in my backyard or in the local park. A field guide is going to have that. Now picking the right field guide for you is gonna be very important. Start very simple. Get the most locally focused field guide you can because there are thousands upon thousands of species of mushrooms. If you get mushrooms of the world, there are gonna be so many things in that book that don't even grow in your area. And there are gonna be things in your area that are just specific to your bioregion and very unique and very wonderful that are never gonna make it in a general field guide like that. So, locally focused field guide, super important. In addition to it being a locally focused field guide, you wanna try and get something that's as recently published as possible. The reason a recently published field guide is the best option is because the names of mushrooms are changing rapidly as genetic studies start to sort things out. We've had names for a long time for certain species, especially in the Pacific Northwest, that are not even their real names. They're the East Coast species, or it's the European species that we've just been using that name. Now that we realize what a mushroom's true identity is through the genetic studies, they're being renamed. So even though the mushrooms themselves don't change, it's gonna be a little bit harder to find the information you want about a mushroom if it's not accurate to the scientific name that it's currently living under. A really good example is this recently published, uh, Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast States. Very area specific and recently published, a uh, fantastic book. So I have a variety of books that are very area specific. Um, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, 
Uh, this one is actually the one I use the most. Right now I'm currently in Washington State, so I don't technically live in the Redwood Coast. However, my environment reflects the Redwood Coast enough that this book is extremely helpful. Also, this book has details in it where it will say, if you live further north, such as into Oregon or Washington, and it has extra notes like that. So it's actually a really great book if you live in the Pacific Northwest. There are a lot of other things here, mushrooms of the Rocky Mountains, mushrooms of the Northeastern United States and Eastern Canada. So there are a lot of area specific mushroom books out there. Uh, take a look in your area and see what you might be able to find. So with these field guides, that is a good place to start. Something locally focused, something recently published, and then you can upgrade from there. Once you start to find a certain fascination with maybe a certain type of mushroom, there are books all about that as well. So this book right here is Ascomycete Fungi of North America. And some of you might be thinking, what in the world does Ascomycete Fungi even mean? But there are some of us who, once we get into mushrooms, realize we like all the weird, tiny, irregular things. That's kind of where Ascomycetes fall on the scale. So there are going to be some really specific books that, yes, do get a little deeper into the science that maybe are not as good for you as a beginner. But no, those things are out there for once you get just as obsessed as I am. Books are great, and so are online resources. Just make sure you are using reputable... Is that the right word? <laughs> make sure you are using reputable online resources. This means don't just post a photo on Instagram and ask somebody to ID it. That's not a good way to ID a mushroom. All right, a couple of online resources that I personally trust, mushroomexpert.com. Uh, Michael Coe runs that website. He has a huge list of mushrooms where he breaks down the ID of them and also has great resources for just general terminology and how to go about foraging, those sorts of things. Another uh, app that you could use on your phone that could help is iNaturalist. iNaturalist is kind of a community science platform, so it's not going to be something where you can necessarily um, flip through like a book, but you can take pictures, upload them, people can help you ID, and then also you can look through other people's photos, maybe even local to you to see what they're finding, see if your mushrooms match their mushrooms, try and figure IDs. Uh, but this also helps create a community science database of mushrooms when they're fruiting and where they're at. They can actually reach a research grade level that la later be used in actual research. So you can participate in community science in that way and also help with some ID stuff. All in all, you just need to make sure that you have a good solid resource, maybe a really good friend who's into mushrooms to help you be an additional research to confirm the idea of certain things. And the next thing when it comes to foraging is you need to be familiar with the mushrooms yourself. You need to understand the structure of a mushroom, the morphology, which is the shape of, of an organism. You need to understand the anatomy of a mushroom. And if that's something that seems a little bit lost on you, even though you've spent some time with mushrooms, please go watch that previous episode I already mentioned. We break down the anatomy of a mushroom. I say that is just one of the most important places to start when it comes to mushroom foraging. I have taught classes for years and I have people who come and attend my classes that maybe have always hunted morels or chanterelles. Those are two most common mushrooms that they harvest. Um, but they have no perspective of how that mushroom compares to everything else in the forest. And they've never spent time getting to know the anatomy or the basic parts of a mushroom. Uh, and I feel like that does such a disservice to people. If you start there, start with the anatomy of a mushroom, then everything else falls into place as you're picking things up off the forest floor, as you're looking at a field guide and reading a description, it all will, it all will make more sense. So please start there you're a beginner at foraging, that's what you really need to do is dive deep into the anatomy of a mushroom. So watch that video. <laughs> I wish I knew someone to help me with mushrooms. Now that you have your basket and your various other tools, a good field guide, go look for mushrooms. Where do you do that? Let me first say, please walk into this with the perspective of not just what can I eat, but what can I learn? 
all right? Because then that means even if you don't have the time to drive a few hours deep into the woods, spend the whole day there collecting mushrooms and come home and work through the ID process because there's work to be done once you get home. <laughs> it doesn't have to start with that. I, so many people tell me they've been wanting to learn about mushrooms for so long, they just don't have the time. They've been wanting to go out to the woods, but they can't. You don't have to start there. Go in your backyard. You go in with the perspective of what can I learn? Your backyard, your local park, the cracks in the sidewalk. Seriously, they have mushrooms. There's stuff going on. If you go and collect and learn, once you go into the woods, it's going to be so much easier. So everywhere, you literally can go everywhere. And if you're thinking, well, I really do want to find edible mushrooms. Great. Guess what? Your local parks, even if you live in the city, they can have edible mushrooms as well. So, you know, you don't always have to make a grand adventure by means of a far travel. You can stay close to home and you can find edible mushrooms as well. So how do you pick a spot, though, that you know is going to have what I would say, the mushrooms you were looking for. Because sometimes, yeah, there are days when I wanna go out and I just wanna see what's there. What is the variety that's going on? Can I find something that I've never seen before? Um, but then there are other days where I am looking for a very specific mushroom. And so for you, if you are learning and you wanna learn about how to hunt a morel, you need to do some research on that mushroom and you need to figure out what kind of environment does it like. So. Here are a few key factors in how to pick a mushroom hunting location. When you're trying to decide what edible mushroom to learn, let me just say first, keep it simple. Learn one or two at a time. Every mushroom is gonna have some kind of look-alike or multiple look-alike. Sometimes the look-alike is incredibly toxic and deadly. Sometimes the look-alike is just really gross and you don't wanna eat it because it tastes nasty, okay? So pick one or two at a time uh, so that you don't have to overwhelm yourself. Uh, pick one that doesn't have very many lookalikes. I kinda already just said that. Make sure that mushroom actually grows local to you. I will say that I maybe in the beginning of my mushroom journey spent maybe like two years looking for a mushroom that doesn't even grow here. <laughs> <laughs> I had heard about this edible mushroom that I thought sounded fantastic and lo and behold it's an east coast species. Whoops! <laughs> Make sure the mushroom in question is the one that actually grows in your area. Okay, good. All right, then next you're going to figure out what season does that mushroom grow in. Uh, so here where I live, spring and fall are predominant mushroom seasons, but in other areas, summer can be one of the primary seasons. It's generally whenever the most rain and moisture is in an area, that's going to be the mushroom season. So I want to use chanterelles as an example. Chanterelles are highly popular edible. They are wonderful. They are delicious. Here, where we are literally standing, October. That's when you want to hunt chanterelles. If I drive two hours, though, to the coast range, July. If I go down to the Gulf states, they're definitely going to be a late spring, early summer kind of mushroom. So even though a chanterelle does grow in your area, you need to figure out in your area when is the right season for it. Because I don't want to be going out here in this in July. It's going to do me no good. So figure out what mushroom you want. Does it actually grow local to you? What season does it fruit in? Then next you're gonna wanna figure out what type of environment does it like? Does it grow with hardwood trees? Does it grow with conifer trees? That typically is the kind of baseline to start with. There are other factors as well. Maybe there's a very specific tree that it has a relationship with. Maybe there's a typical kind of soil that it really likes. Is it like really sandy soil? That's common for some mushrooms. Think about all those factors and then you can put it all together and it will help you narrow down and kind of triangulate where you need to go. Then you can actually use the internet to your advantage to some degree. So here in Washington state, say I found a mushroom that I really want to find. I know what season it grows, um, but it only grows in really old growth forests. Well, how do I know where that is? Well, you can do a little internet search and say, old growth forest hikes in Washington. <laughs> and there you go. You might have a couple of trails or a couple of pockets in the mountains that would be good to go to. 
It is really important to know, are you allowed to harvest mushrooms in an area though? The, the mushroom permit system is different state by state. Some areas you don't need a permit at all, but you only can collect a limited amount of mushrooms. Some areas you're required to have a permit, but it's a free permit. Sometimes you can get it online. Sometimes you have to go in in person. So just look into it to see if it is allowed. If you're in a nature preserve or some kind of protected area, generally those areas, you know, you're not allowed to remove firewood, don't remove any plants, probably not allowed to, to remove mushrooms as well. So just keep that in mind so that you're not getting, getting yourself in trouble and going and harvesting mushrooms where you shouldn't. So location and time of year, those are kind of the two essential factors that need to meet up at the same time in order for you to find the specific mushroom you might be looking for. So you may be in the right location, but maybe there hadn't been enough rain yet, or maybe there'd been a ton of rain, but you're not in the right type of environment. So matching those two things is going to be probably the hardest part. And if you do find success, if you do find the honey hole and you find that patch of mushrooms, keep in mind of what's going on in the environment around you, what kind of trees are there, uh, what was going on in the weather patterns, and try and remember that so that you can recreate that in the future. You can return to that location. A lot of mushrooms do return year after year. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. But also you just remembering that environment, you can be driving along on a summer camping trip and be like, wow, that spot right over there, it reminds me so much of where we found all those chanterelles last year. Maybe this would be a good spot to come back to. You can always be on the lookout for good mushroom locations if you're aware of trees um, and shrubs or other factors like that. So you can always be scouting even if it's not typically in season for that mushroom. That being said, it is a lot of work sometimes to find a good mushroom location. So if you ever run across somebody who's being really tight-lipped, please don't hold it against them. They may, can, may have, they may have taken years for them to find some of their favorite locations that they go mushroom hunting in. And if someone brings you with them to one of their favorite spots, please protect and safeguard that. Don't go back and pillage their mushrooms. I don't want to say their mushrooms. I don't like how possessive that sounds. You can keep that in with me saying that. <laughs> don't go in and pillage the mushrooms from the area. Um, you know, they're trying to share a resource with you. And just like we need to respect each other, we need to respect the land. Just be kind. If someone's being generous, use their generosity in a positive way. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that, except there's a reason mushroom hunters keep their spot secrets. Um, but if you kind of follow those little steps I talked about and how to triangulate an area to go, you'll be well on your way in finding your own, your own spots. Those details of finding a specific environment in a certain time of year, that goes into play when you are looking for a very specific mushroom and you want to find that one. But if you just want to go out and find mushrooms, like I already said, you could really go anywhere. And I love having conversations with people where they find out I do mushroom stuff and they're like, are there really that many mushrooms out there? Uh, yes. And I say, trust me, after this five minute conversation, you're going to walk away and you're going to realize mushrooms are everywhere, especially after a rain. So here in October, after a good rain, I don't even have to go a hundred yards and I can fill my basket with so many different species. And sometimes I'll be pleasantly surprised. Oh, I'm in an area that has some edible mushrooms. That's great. But the variety alone is just really fun for me. Um, something that can be really helpful. If you're going out and you're just wanting to say, what can I find today? Don't overwhelm yourself and take the whole forest floor home with you. Because when you take them home and then try and walk through the ID process with them, which again is in that previous episode, it can get really overwhelming. But here are some things that I do um, that can be really helpful for you. Maybe only collect, depending on how, uh, you know, up for it you're feeling, five to ten different mushroom species that you've never noticed before. Separate them into different bags so that 
you don't get them all mashed up together. I don't even know how long this took me. I would put stuff in my basket and I would think to myself, oh, I'll be able to just mentally remember like where I set that mushroom and what goes with which. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> when your old basket's full of stuff and you think you can go home an idea, it's not helpful. Separating them into bags is very helpful. Also, having those note cards, write some notes about it. I found this mushroom by the stream. It was next to some conifer trees, blah, blah, blah. Whatever you wanna write on it, you can do that. Then you can put the note card in the bag with the mushrooms and you have that information when you go back home. In addition to that, the backside of the note card actually makes a really good spot for doing a spore print. If you do not know what a spore print is, I talk about it in the previous episode, but you essentially put a mushroom down on a piece of paper to wait for its spores to release so that you can see the spore color. So guess what? You can do that, tuck it into a bag, then you can fold the bag over on itself and then stack these in your basket. And by the time you get home, you could have the mushroom, the spore print, and the notes all in one which helps you as you go about trying to learn. So that's just one organizational thing that I think is really helpful. And not overwhelming yourself by taking the whole forest home, as fun as that might seem at first. As you're out collecting mushrooms, be sure if you don't know what it is and you want to learn what it is, you need to take the whole mushroom with you, okay? Or at least unearth the entire thing to take pictures of the entire thing. There is so much important information that could be going on underneath the soil at the base of that stem or even deeper that you will miss out on if you do not unearth the entire thing. So please do this. But then when it comes to harvesting mushrooms that you already know what they are, you already know it's that great edible mushroom, I'm gonna take it home to cook, then you can harvest differently. You can choose to pluck your mushroom or cut your mushroom, whichever you prefer. But the general rule, no matter who you are, is the less dirt in your basket, the better, all right? So do some trimming, do some cleaning, use that brush, use that knife, keep those mushrooms as clean as possible, and then put them in your basket because you're not worried about having to see all the mushroom parts to ID it because you already know what it is. Does that make sense? There's two methods of harvesting. Harvesting if you're trying to ID and harvesting when you already know what it is and you're collecting for the table. This is also another reason why I have sometimes different bags in my basket. Um, I really love hedgehog mushrooms, but they are so fragile that I can't just put them in with everything else. So I usually put them in a separate little bag to keep them kind of off to the side. Uh, also, if I'm collecting, say, a bunch of edible mushrooms, but I'm also collecting things that I want to take home and identify, I like to keep those separate because the ones I'm collecting to identify have a lot of dirt on them because I'm taking the whole thing with me. Also, there's a chance that as I'm collecting things to identify, there could be a toxic mushroom in there. Now, here's the thing. A toxic mushroom is not going to sit up against an edible mushroom and be like, hey, I'm going to rub my toxins on you. Like that doesn't happen. There's no not tr there's not transfer. OK, it doesn't exist. However, mushrooms are very fragile. And what if you have everything in the same basket? And there's some things that look similar and you get home and you start chopping things up and preparing things for the table. What if a little chunk of a, of a, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what if a little chunk of a poisonous mushroom got in that pile, but you didn't notice because it was just like a small chunk of it. So keep those things separate just for safety and then also just for cleanliness as you keep the dirt away from your edible mushrooms. I think that kind of covers the basics there for you. Um, have your supplies, your basket, your foraging tool. Pick a good field guide that's locally focused to you and as recently published as possible. If you're going to harvest an edible mushroom, uh, pick something that's easy for a beginner to start with and figure out all the details around that mushroom so you can triangulate where to find it and what season to find it in. Go out and collect 
a variety of mushrooms, but don't overwhelm yourself. Don't take everything with you. Start as simple as possible. Work through that ID process. Try and, you know, hone in your skills there. Uh, find success in even just the little things that you're able to identify and the little mushrooms that you're able to find too. Those are kind of the basics of what it takes just to go out and start foraging mushrooms. It's actually pretty simple. And so I hope that helps you as you go along. Uh, and if there are certain mushrooms that you are interested in learning about, chances are I might have a video about one of those mushrooms that will help you find those details, like how to identify them and where to find them and when to look for them. So check out one of those videos if you are interested in those mushrooms. Thank you for coming along with me today and learning about the basics of foraging. Oh, I didn't say subscribe or anything. Do I need to? Nope. Okay. Good enough? Yep. Okay. And I'm cutting. You're... Bleh.